Good evening, I'm Rick Lord. Welcome to another episode of Outside the Echo Chamber. We are inside the state capitol where the legislative session is already underway and already a lot to talk about. A little bit later in this show, we will dive deeper into the DHHR issue. There have already been some things transpiring in the Senate regarding that, but we began with a look at what happened Wednesday night with Governor Jim Justice's State of the State Address. And joining me right off the top are two gentlemen to give their reaction on what they saw and heard last night inside the chambers. Mike Pushkin, the chairman of the Democratic Party in the state of West Virginia, and Eric Householder, who is the majority leader on the Republican side in the House. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. And let's just uh, get right into what we saw last night. I'll begin with you, Mike. Uh, sure. Just give me a brief rundown. Um, obviously, the Cliff's Notes version, $100 million for PEIA, a relatively flat budget, 5% increase, which is actually less than the rate of inflation. So a flat budget. And the big tsunami, as the governor put it, a 50% personal income tax reduction spread out over three years. His proposal was 30, 10, 10. What are your thoughts on what you heard and saw last well, night? I mean, I, I'd be very interested into uh, uh, you know seeing how he'd he, have him show his work on this. You know, so you tell a math student, show your work. Um, I, I offered these uh, you know, large tax cuts with a lot of increased spending. Uh, I don't know how that how that's going to add up. Now, a lot of what the governor proposed last night, I'd be fully supportive of, uh, especially when it comes to putting money towards our food banks, ending hunger in West Virginia. Of course, that's a, you know, I'm sure both parties can get behind that. Um, but I, I was a uh, uh, a bit concerned that it was a, wasn't really uh, big on detail, just like that we're going to put money at this problem, we're going to put money at that problem, we're going to throw money at this problem uh, while having a massive tax cut. It doesn't seem to add up. And obviously, to be able to pay for something like that, you need this kind of surplus consistently. I mean, they might have enough to, to take care of the, I think it's $800 million would be the year one hit for the 30%. Uh, that's okay for next year, but are you going to have that type of surplus going forward when this is going to be in effect for perpetuity, really? Yeah, exactly. It, it, it just doesn't seem responsible to spend a lot of one-time money for, to fix ongoing problems. So. Eric, what did you think about that proposal? I was very happy with the governor's uh, personal income tax cuts. It's something that I've been working on for the last three to four years. And keep in mind, the governor does have it structured with a 30% tax cut, 10% the second year, 10% the third year. But there's another uh, advocate to this bill or another safety net that I've actually worked out with the governor, I would like to see $700 million come out of this year's surplus that the budget that we're in now and use that $700 million as a safety net in case something were to go awry. It is very feasible to do. Uh, we're on target to have a $1.8, $1.9 billion budget. If we can control the rate of spending, it's easy peasy. It's able to do, but that's the key. Now that'd be almost like a rainy day fund. It's a, it's a separate rainy day fund in a sense, yes. But it'll be confined to that bill that if things were to go awry, then we have a way, we have a backstop. Now there's no other triggers in this bill. It's just a straight 30% cut, second year 10%, third, third year 10%. At that point, the legislature has a decision to make. Do they want to, at some future time, enact future tax cuts? And I think at that time, you're going to have to see some type of tax shifting. I do believe the next 10, 20, 30% after that, you may need to raise the sales tax 2% in order to uh, to do some type of tax shifting. Because remember, the personal income tax brings in roughly $2.7 billion every year. Effectively, with this bill that the governor announced last night, it's about a $1.1 billion cut. So. Now, I think in theory, the, the goal would be if, if you can shrink the personal income tax, that might encourage more people to come here to work here. I mean, you see Florida always touts that. We have zero personal income tax. Obviously, West Virginia is not Florida. Right, right. There are a lot of reasons for people for, to move to Florida. Exactly. But you're going to have to make up that hole somehow. Would, would the theory be that you can sh you can expand the base to maybe even if people are paying less, there are more people paying? Well, and that's the key. If we want to if we want to differentiate, differentiate ourselves with our surrounding neighboring states, we're going to have to do something. I had advocated for two income tax brackets, a 1% and a 3%. If we were to do that, we would have the lowest tax rates from New Hampshire to the Florida line. Pennsylvania has 3.07 personal income tax. I mean, now you have states like Texas and Florida with no income tax. They're now saying, hey, what else can we do to make ourselves more attractive? So states that have no personal income tax have been winning, been proven. Mike, how would you like to see this tax reform done? 
Well, one thing I, I'm, I'm leery of is what, something that uh, the majority leader mentioned, that eventually at some point we're going to have to look at shifting the tax burden. And uh, I would be leery of something that shifts the tax burden more on, on, on a regressive tax, such as a sales tax, one that affects you know, poor and working class people more than it does sure. uh, the, and, the wealthy. And how do, you, how do you target those types of things? Because obviously there are always going to be some people that can afford to be in a higher tax well, an bracket. Income tax, an matter. income tax is progressive right. and a sales tax tax is, reg is regressive. It affects poor and working class people to a greater extent, uh, percentage-wise. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons why people would move to places like Texas or Florida or, or even Tennessee. Uh, now, I would hope that, that, that this plan would, would work. If this is what we do, I would hope it does work. But there's a lot of, a lot of ifs there, a lot of hypotheticals. And I think we're really setting ourselves up for um, real problems in the future. Look at uh, what happened in Kansas uh, over a decade ago. I think we should learn. Unless one thing that you know, the governor brought up briefly, not in great detail, some of the problems that we've had at the DHHR, problems uh, that affect the 7,000 children in foster care, problems that affect people that are still on this IDD uh, waiting list, uh, problems that we've had in our state medical facilities. We have a whole lot of issues in this state. The governor said you know, we're going to throw money at this issue, throw money at that issue. All the meanwhile, with the, with the huge tax cut, I, I don't possibly see how it could add up. And we are going to talk about DHHR a little bit later in this show. PEIA also came up. Obviously, Jim Kaufman kind of dropped a bomb a week before the session began with his, his announcement about what's going on with the, with the hospital system maybe not being able to take PEIA patients anymore. $100 million to PEIA, is that enough? It's a temporary solution, but the key word there is temporary until we find... A, uh, until we designate a real revenue stream to make to keep uh, PEIA solvent uh, without raising uh, premiums uh, on the members. And the members I'm most concerned about are the retirees. They don't get it. When the governor says he's going to uh, have a pay raise for, for state employees, he's not talking about retirees. When their premiums go up, it's a huge cut. These folks aren't making a whole lot of money. The governor last night said that he wanted to give a cost of living adjustment up to $1,000 up to $1,000. There's, there are folks that are living on, on way less than a thousand dollars a month in this state, and they have been for quite some time. We need to take care of them. Eric, how does PEI get a PEIA? Let me let me slow down. PEIA. How does that get fixed without a, a massive premium increase? You, don't, you, you try to run the numbers there. It seems tough. And before I answer that, I do want to go back to the sales tax component. Why sure. I think that is not an issue. Most citizens, you're lucky if you're spending twenty dollars a month in sales tax. We have no sales tax on food. We have no sales tax on prescription. Add it up. Really, the sales tax is only a factor when you're buying a big, big ticket item. Sales taxes, I'm not worried about it. But to get back to your, your premise of your question, for years, we keep uh, circumventing the state statute. The statute says that for every dollar that we put in, we being the employer, the state taxpayers, the recipients must put in 20 cents. We put in a dollar, they put in 20 cents. We've been circumventing the state statute for years. I think this is an opportunity to have a, a good conversation, a path forward. This is only me speaking, this is not the call. Uh, I believe that this is an opportunity for us to sit down and decide what is our path forward for PEI. Do we want to continue to put money in the back door? We're using the back door approach. It's a bailout. Every time that we put money in the back door, it's a taxpayer bailout. We're not honoring what's in state statute. Uh, does this give us an opportunity to say, hey, look, yes, reimbursement rates are out of whack, uh, but we had our payer mix is not very good in West Virginia either. Our commercial market is shrinking and shrinking. Usually you have about a 60-40 payer mix. Most of our state is either on Medicaid, Medicare, or PEIA, so we're on some type of government-sponsored health care. So our commercial market is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. It's not sustainable. The taxpayers of West Virginia are paying close to a billion dollars for PEIA, and at some point, it's, it's just not sustainable. So what do you do about it? How do you, how do you get that well, permanent fix well, in place? Well, you're going to have to do one of two things. And it, once again, this is only me speaking, not the caucus. Some of the ideas that I've thought about over the years, privatization. What does that mean? Well, there's two ways. There's probably a couple more than just these two ways. Do you cut ties completely? And then uh, adjust, you know, for inflation every year with a health savings account of like maybe five percent. Or does the state still stay in it, but contracts with somebody? 
So there's different ways, but I think we need to sit down and have a serious conversation. Do we need premium increases? We've even seen Dale Lee with WBEA stand up and say that, hey, this is not sustainable. We may need to have premium increases. So all that needs to be on the table. We need to have those discussions if we're going to proceed with PEIA. Uh, I, you know, when, when people take a job in the public sector, and it's an honorable thing to do, uh, public service, to work in the public sector, and, and we tell them, you know, the pay's not great, at least they used to tell them this, the pay's not great, uh, but the benefits are. Uh, and then the benefits have gotten uh, less and less. And uh, that's why we have to protect the, keeping those premiums at a, at a reasonable rate. Because, you know, they, they rarely get pay raises, and when they do, we have to vote on that, whether or not they get a pay raise, unlike the private sector. Um, uh, to me, we have to make sure. I, I think the key is to find a, a, a permanent uh, funding stream for PEIA and make good on the promise that we made to these folks when they took a job in the public sector, especially those who are no longer working, who don't get a pay raise, who are living on next to nothing. To raise their premiums, I think, would just be criminal. Oh, but to talk about PEIA, it's only for active employees is what I'm talking about. If for He's talking about retirees. I'm only talking about active yeah, active recipients, so it wouldn't okay. affect wouldn't affect retirees. Now, Mike, you mentioned pay raises. The governor said another five percent for state employees, which would include school teachers. Again, with the rate of inflation, that's almost barely, if not keeping up with with the, the costs that are going out yeah. for for families in this state. Um, there's not a single person that doesn't think teachers are heroes in this state. Uh, you know, what what can we do for them? What can we do to make them stay here in this state and get good teachers here? Five percent increase um, is that is that enough going forward? What do you do to keep teachers? He barely touched on the teacher shortage and the, really the bus driver shortage is another huge issue in the state. What do you do to to, to address those needs here? Because if, if you run out of bus drivers, there's a lot of a lot of families that, that need those bus drivers to get their kids to school. Well, he, to be honest, he barely touched on a lot of things. I think the speech in its, in its entirety was very short on detail. Uh, but he did offer a 5% pay raise. It doesn't mean the legislature uh, would bring it up. I would hope that we would. Actually, I'd hope we would increase it. I don't think it's enough to keep up with inflation. Uh, but I know we would support a pay raise. I hope we can do more. One of the things that the governor touched on last night was locality pay. It's an issue that we need in Berkeley County. Now, House Finance has been working on a locality pay issue. It's to create a five-member commission and the legislature's role, the only role that the legislature has, is to appropriate money to this commission. So it takes the politics out of it. Um, this commission will have nine factors that they must indicate, hey, this county, this county is deserving of locality pay. Uh, I think teachers, good teachers in our area, I mean, they're being pulled away in Loudoun County. I'm less than 30 minutes from Loudoun County where teachers can make eighty, ninety thousand dollars 90000 But... I'm supportive of the teacher pay raise. It is the fourth raise that we've done under this governor, and uh, but it's still to be decided. Remember, the governor, the governor made a lot of promises last night on a lot of issues, and he and he attached a huge dollar amount to a lot of these issues. But it's the legislature's role to appropriate the money. So some of these items we can take. We could take one. We could take all of them, or we could take none of them. That's the legislature's purview. And of course, that's the separation. You know, the legislative yeah. branch is separate yeah. from the executive branch, so he can propose things. It's up to you guys to get it done. Uh, and and there there have been some conflicts with Amendment Two, famously, with yes. between the governor and the legislature. Do you anticipate any 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 road bumps or any speed bumps over the next sixty days with what was said last night, or what? And how does that differ from what your agenda might be? It's it's hopeful. If if you're asking me, will the Senate be on board with the personal income tax cut? I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. I think Amendment Two is over. I think the voters spoke loud and clear. They are saying no. I hope our Senate colleagues on the other side have heard it just as well as we have on the House. Mike, Mike yeah. what are you looking forward to over the next two months? Well, I would agree well, with the majority leader that Amendment 2 is over and the voters did speak loud and clear. And I hope that they, the Senate doesn't try to do this uh, backdoor reimbursement to make up for the heavy equipment uh, heavy equipment tax on, on, on large businesses. Um, well, and and. You're right. The legislature does have the power of the person. It's up to us uh, to uh, to appropriate the large sums of money. But one thing that was brought up last night that that that, that troubled me with the, with the governor um, bring up how he wanted to spend the American Rescue Plan money, uh, money that that was you know, sent to us by Congress with 
all Democratic votes. Not a single Republican voted for it. It was signed into law by President Biden, who he was very critical of at the beginning of the speech, and then went on to talk about how he was going to spend the money that President Biden and Joe Manchin sent to him. Um, and I, while it may be within the guidelines, he said about taking over, you know, about a half a billion dollars, more than half a billion dollars, and putting it into the economic impact fund to, uh, for businesses. Um, while that may be within the guidelines, I'm not sure it is. I don't think it's within the spirit of the law that was passed in Congress. That money is supposed to be for communities that were impacted by COVID and the communities that were most impacted by COVID, uh, which would be most, the most marginalized communities. I think that we should take a large part of that money, uh, pass it down to the municipalities, uh, where there are no municipalities, to the counties. They know where the greatest need are. Base it on the percentage of poverty in each of these municipalities and each of these counties. And, and get that money to where it can do the most good to the people who need it the most and actually provide relief like it was meant. That's what, uh, that's what the Congress and the president meant that money to be spent on, uh, not for the, the governor to use it in this economic impact fund. We're running out of time, Eric. What's the one, one thing you can, you can touch on that and then give me the one thing that you're looking for most to doing over the next year? Personal years. income tax, by far. Uh, but keep in mind, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think that's what we're trying. I think that's what the legislature is trying to do with the second tranche of ARPA funds, $677 million. We would like to keep $500 million into economic development where new businesses, high impact businesses can come in. And, and when that happens, wages, real wages increase. We're no longer talking about minimum wage. Now we're talking about real wages and they are increasing. The governor talked about 29 companies and an investment the state of West Virginia has invested $6 million created 3,300 new jobs, preserved 3,100 existing jobs. That's powerful for the citizens, for the taxpayer. That's money in their pocket. I'm sure we'll have much more to talk about over the next 60 days. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. House ma ma Majority Leader, let me get that right. It's been 80, 80 years here where, where the Democrats were in charge, and it's hard to say that the Republicans have such a super majority now. Majority Leader Eric Householder, Democratic Party Chair Mike Pushkin, thank you guys for joining us, and we'll, we'll see you again over the next couple months for sure. Thanks, Mike. And we will be right back with more Outside the Echo Chamber right after this. August 5th. 2013 was supposed to be the happiest day of my life. It turned into a nightmare. Harmony was too big for me to pass through my pelvis. They thought the best option was to put the vacuum on her. She begged for a C-section over and over and over. They wanted to rush through it. Once Harmony came out, she was, it probably wasn't five minutes. They rushed her to NIC unit and then her head swelled the size of a watermelon. It pretty much crushed her whole skull. Ben Salingo was recommended to us by a family friend that he had represented. Having Ben Salingo on our side changed everything for the better. From day one, he did everything for us. He kept in touch with us pretty much on a daily basis to let us know what was going on and even just to check on us. It gave us closure as a family, a peace, a calming feeling over us that she can rest in peace. Welcome back to Outside the Echo Chamber, inside the state capitol where the legislative session is underway. And we want to deep dive now into one of the huge issues that will be talked about over the next 60 days, the DHHR. And joining me now, Senator Charles Trump and Marissa Sanders, who is the, let me get this right, the Executive Director of the West Virginia Foster Adoptive and Kinship Parents Network. Senator Trump, I want to begin with you because it was your letter that really kind of kicked off this whole thing in early December, bringing up some of the issues with the DHHR and what you felt needed to be done. This is a very complex, very nuanced issue, but briefly, what are your concerns with that agency and what can be done moving forward with it? Well, in the context of child services, youth services, child protective services, which was what my letter was focused on, uh, we have uh, some enormous problems in our eastern panhandle right now, and I don't think uh, the problems are limited to the eastern panhandle, West Virginia, uh, but they may be more acute there than in other places. Uh, but we, we don't have staff. My little county in Morgan County has no, zero, child protective services workers stationed in the DHHR office there and no youth services workers. To the extent that the county, that little county is being served, it's being served by workers who are assigned to other counties. And uh, 
situation in those other counties is not much better. Uh, the last check and information I had was that Berkeley County had one services worker who has responsibility for over 400 cases that are already in court. And Marissa, I mean, this is your life work, so you, you know the numbers, you've seen the problems. Um, is it fair to call this a crisis? Uh, it is, but I would say it's a crisis of our own making. You know, we, we have, we investigate families at a far higher rate than any other state. We, and that leads to family separations at a much higher rate, which leads to termination of parental rights at a much higher rate, which has led to a staffing shortage, a shortage of foster families, children placed in out of state facilities. But it, it starts with our, our screening and investigating process where we have brought way too many kids into the system. Now you can throw money at it and money helps because you need money to pay for things, but uh, are there any other things that can be done to basically blow it all up to just start from scratch and, and reorganize and get this done the right way? Well, where the money is really needed, and as you've heard me say, we investigate, remove children, terminate rights, and, um, and, and place kids out of state at higher rates than any other state. What we don't do more than any other state is, is pay for prevention, fund our prevention services, and support families before the kids are removed. Is that something that the legislature can get on board with? I know the governor last night during his State of the State briefly touched on it, basically saying we're reorganizing the DHHR, but didn't really go into much detail. I mean, what can be done responsibly? So let me first of all say, I agree with Marissa on part of her thesis there, and that is that we have uh, removal rates and termination of parental rights in West Virginia that is far too high. and. A lot of that results in the institutionalization of kids at, at unacceptably high rates. We have the latest numbers I've seen are over 6,300 children in West Virginia who are in that system, foster care system. And uh, while there are certainly families uh, where that is going to be necessary, we're way above the national average and we have far too many children as a percentage of our youth population uh, in that system. And I will agree with Marissa on this point. A big part of that problem is that we haven't developed the ability to provide services to families where they are, where they live, in a way that would maybe prevent the disintegration of these families or permanent removal of these children from their homes. Now, having said that, there are, there are situations where the kids have to be removed from a home and probably have to ultimately be placed with someone else, another family, uh, be, uh, the level of dysfunction being so high that you know, they, the family can't be salvaged, uh, the level of abuse or neglect. But that's not every case. There are lots of cases where kids get caught in this web uh, when the only reason they're stuck there is because we don't provide the services that you need to prevent them from being stuck there. You, met, you brought up a point saying that it was uh, a crisis of our own making. Um, you know, the, the DHHR is a, casts a wide, wide shadow, a big umbrella, uh, child protective services, child welfare, only one of the things that, that they've been tasked with doing. And, and as we've seen, there, there are many, many issues surrounding that agency. Um, do you believe that, that there was just, you brought up the word dysfunction, do you think there was just complete dysfunction in that agency in terms of just overall dysfunction that they weren't able to focus on, on certain things or what, what do you think was the main issue there? I mean, I think there's dysfunction at a lot of different levels in the system, not only DHHR. I think, I think our lack of prevention and our lack of services for families before any abuse happens are, um, our culture of investigating and referring families, quite honestly, making it a crime for people not to, to call in what they think might be possibly child abuse has probably led to more referrals to CPS, which leads to more investigations and more removals um, because they're terrified. You know, the kid comes to school one day with dirty clothes. Well, maybe something could possibly be going on at home. Maybe I should call CPS. And then we're investigating those cases. Or someone told me that their child was investigated because there was a bug in their backpack or there was referred to CPS because there was a bug in their backpack. 
So, I, you know, you look at that, you look at the court end of things. There's a lot of dysfunction and a lot of, you know, all the way so across it, the system. It's on both ends. They're, they're investigating things that, that could just be benign. And then in other cases, they're they're ignoring things that, that could be huge. Uh, or missing them because missing they're busy them. investigating yeah, not, the things not, that are Not benign. getting to them. Not even getting right. to them. And so we have common ground on this. We talked about uh, before we went on camera here, uh, we have to do a good job of screening out the calls or referrals that really aren't true abuse or neglect uh, we, so that the people whose job whose jobs it is to uh, investigate true abuse and neglect of children can focus their energy and time on that as opposed to things that don't rise to the level of full state intervention. I agree with you. Now the session just began but on day one Senate President Craig Blair suspended the rules and fast-tracked a, a couple of bills that, that dealt with, with DHHR. One of them would be splitting it up into three basically separate agencies, Department of Health, Department of Human Services, and Department of Health Facilities, which would basically manage hospitals. Uh, it seems to me like what they're trying to say there is maybe if we can get them focused on specific things, kind of split it up instead of one agency having to try to do everything, we make it three different agencies that might have their own focus. So do, do you think that that's something that, that might help out to, to, to break that up and to give them more focus and target? I mean, I think it's possible it could help. I'm not, I'm kind of neutral on whether it's going to be solve anything. What I will say is that simply dividing a department and moving people to different, under different umbrellas doesn't actually change anything. What is needed is a change in how we do the work, a change in how people are held accountable to do the work, and how, and, and a cultural change in as how we, view families and how we support them and provide the needs of needed services before we get to that point. Senator Trump, what can we do over the next 60 days to fix this? Well, uh, and just for the record, I voted for the bill yesterday that we uh, have sent to the House of Delegates. It's similar, but not identical to a bill that was passed last year by both houses of the legislature and vetoed by the governor. We believe that separation of the department into some of its distinct uh, areas of responsibility and jurisdiction to make things more efficient. And we wanted to get started on it very early. You know, we did it on the first day to get it over to the House of Delegates. I'm not um, you know, going to take the position that the bill we passed is uh, exactly what the final outcome should look like. But we want to, it's important enough, it's an important enough issue. We want to start a legislative conversation very early in the session. The House of Delegates now has that measure in its possession, and I hope it will result in uh, work by both houses in cooperation with the executive that will provide for a structure that, that does better than we've done uh, in terms of managing these problems that we have. Marissa, obviously this is very dear to your heart. What does what a successful session look like? to you over the next 60 days, what, what can get done that, that you'd be happy with? Um, first of all, involving more stakeholders is always a key, really listening to the people on the ground who are impacted by these services and support and, and systems. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention that was also in the letter that I think is a great thing and would really help is something that some states call a differential or, or alternative response. So right now, if you call CPS or call Central Intake and, and, and say that you're concerned about a family, they essentially have two choices. They can screen it in and investigate it, or they can screen it out and do nothing. And a differential response would give them a third option, which would be to send it to ideally someone entirely outside of government, definitely outside of CPS, a nonprofit or something, who then can go and help the family. We, we hear you need childcare. What can we do to help you get childcare? Um, how can we help you get your lights turned back on or get an exterminator or a washer and dryer or whatever it is that, that is. So in those cases, it would not be things that rise to the level of abuse and neglect but are you know, concerning in a family that's struggling. Um, and right now, I, I believe that one of the reasons we have so many referrals from educators is because they think CPS could help this family, but a CPS worker comes in with the, investig the investigatory lens on. Their job is to look for issues, not to say, how can we connect you to services? So having that in place and well-funded and supported would, would be wonderful. I know that you have another commitment to, to get, get yeah, you, so just really quickly, what uh, how confident are you that this can get fixed over the next two months? Uh, I think we can make forward progress. I think we have uh, some problems that are going to require time and attention across a series of legislative sessions and into the future. I really like what Melissa was just talking about. 
trying to provide services to families in their homes before you get to these draconian and drastic outcomes. I think that could be a big part, it should be something we should look at to be a part of the solution. I'm heartened by this. So far, I haven't encountered anybody in the executive branch, the legislative branch, who has the attitude that this is not something we need to spend time and resources and energy. So where there's will and uh, you know, common, common cause, I think we can get there. You're talking about the children of West Virginia. I think everyone can get on board. It's, it's a, you know, a problem that is worthy of having the shoulder to the wheel from every branch of the government and outside the government. Like We've just reached the tip of the iceberg. This is something I'm sure that we'll be circling back on with both of you over the next couple of months. We thank you for your time today. Thank you. A lot thank to you get to, so yes. we will, uh, we'll definitely uh, keep this front and center over the, the course of the session. Thank the, you, Senator. Senator Trump has, has to go. We'll talk again. <laughs> Marissa, thank you so much for joining us today as well. And again, something we'll be, we'll be diving into much more over the next couple of months. But we'll be right back to wrap up this episode of Outside the Echo Chamber right after this. It's the New Year's sales event going on right now at Dutch Miller Chevrolet in Huntington. For a limited time, get up to $8,000 off select brand new 2022 Silverados and 2.9% financing with no payments for 90 days. Or take advantage of supplier pricing or less on new Camaros, Trax, Trailblazers, Traverses, and Blazers. Chevy owners can also receive $2,000 in lease loyalty credits. Text or chat now at DutchMillerChevy.com. Make sure you are informed. With HD Media, we are leading the state in local, digital, and print media. We are storytellers. We focus on education, health, entertainment, politics, opinions, sports, and the outdoors through our websites, print, or social and mobile apps. We work every day to enhance the lives of our customers by informing, entertaining, and empowering our readers in the communities we serve. We are HD Media. Well, that's going to do it for another edition of Outside the Echo Chamber. It's another busy day here inside the state capitol. The West Virginia State Youth Program is here. They help people with disabilities get back into the workforce. It's sponsored by WARF, the West Virginia Association of Rehabilitation Facilities. A lot of uh, menu items on the agenda, so to speak, inside both chambers today as well, with different bills up for debate. And next week on Outside the Echo Chamber, we will start looking into the PEIA issue, which, of course, is one of the big elephants in the room. But we always thank you for joining us for these shows, and we are trying to keep you informed as the topics present themselves. And until we see you next time on another episode of Outside the Echo Chamber, I'm Rick Lord. Take care.